Representatives, John Boehner. So much for the schedule. Thank you. And good morning. Uh, thanks for uh, showing up on a uh, rainy, cold day. Probably didn't have anything else to do, so you had to come. Uh, but uh, it's really good to be here. I want to thank uh, the Detroit uh, Chamber for, uh, for having me here, and I'm glad that all of you are here. You know, two years ago this month, I was at the University of Notre Dame, along with Vice President uh, Joe Biden, uh, to receive uh, the Latore Medal the highest honor they give out at uh, their commencement. And uh, I told the students that day that Latari is a Latin word. In English, it means rejoice. Exactly what I've done every single day since I retired. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, uh, I never thought in my wildest dreams I'd ever do what I did in my career. And a lot of you know, I grew up in Cincinnati. I have uh, eight brothers, three sisters, and my dad owned a bar. And uh, I tell people all the lessons I learned growing up were the lessons I needed uh, to do my job when I became speaker. Grew up in a big family, you have to learn to get along with each other, get things done together as a family. You grew up in a bar, I mopped floors, did dishes, waited tables, tended bar. You need to learn a couple other lessons. The first lesson is you have to learn to deal with every jackass that walks in the door. <laughs> Believe me, when I became speaker, I needed to know that lesson well. Uh, but the other lesson you learn is uh, the art of being able to disagree without being disagreeable. You know, uh, that, that drunk's going to be sitting there at the end of the bar all evening, and you don't want to fight with a guy, but you don't agree with him. And so uh, you learn this, uh, this art of being able to disagree without being disagreeable. Uh, probably the most important lesson uh, that I learned growing up that uh, helped me uh, throughout my political career. Uh, but, uh, you know, like a lot of you, I found a way to work myself through school. I found myself in a small business uh, that I bought and over the years turned it into a very successful business. Uh, but along the way, I got involved in my neighborhood homeowners association and ended up as Speaker of the House. <laughs> this too could happen to you. Uh, I, I, I never thought I'd run for office. It never crossed my mind. Uh, but, you know, one thing led to another and ended up running for township trustee. Then I was in the state house for six years. And then in 1990, my incumbent congressman uh, got himself in some trouble. And he wasn't going to win, but he was still running. And people were encouraging me to run. And I kept saying, no, I'm not going to run. I'm not doing this. I'm not walking away from my business. Uh, but, uh, you know, eventually uh, something in my gut just kept telling me, you ought to try to do this. Now, it's really hard to win an election when people can't say your name. You know, my name's Beaner, Bonner, Boner. I've heard, I've heard them all. And I find myself in a race, uh, my first race for Congress in a Republican primary uh, with the incumbent uh, and this former member of Congress who'd run for the Senate, uh, lost in a few years earlier and wanted his job back. His name was Tom Kindness. <laughs> Kindness. So uh, we work like, we work like dogs for six months, get our, uh, get everything the campaign all wound up, uh, we raise all this money and we decide all right, we're going to do the official announcement and we're going to spend all of this money. And, uh, and we just blitz the TV, radio, mail, I was uh, appearing everywhere and in the height of all of this we took our first poll and I was losing by 82 points. <laughs> you want to talk about depressed. And, uh, but uh, after that my staff lied to me for the next six months and uh, never told me how bad it was, but we were never within 80 points of winning. Uh, but you have to remember, uh, elections aren't won and lost based on what the polls say, they're won and lost based on who shows up to vote. And uh, luckily for me, uh, I was able to turn my people out to vote uh, and won. My opponent did nothing. Why? Because he was up 80 points. Uh, he didn't have to do anything. Uh, but uh, it was a lesson that uh, uh, more people that, than I have learned uh, over the years. Uh, but that uh, began a 25-year uh, run uh, in the United States Congress. And it was, uh, it was a great, frankly, a very good experience. Uh, I never wanted to be governor, never wanted to go to the Senate. You know, going to the Senate was like going to uh, the funeral parlor. <laughs> you know, that place is just boring over there. <laughs> you know, the house by its nature is supposed to be this rambunctious place, and it is. 
uh, which uh, really kind of makes it exciting. You get to meet an awful lot of people. You get to work with a lot of people. Uh, last night, I got to see my old friend uh, John Dingle, uh, who I learned uh, mountains from over the years. And, uh, and even uh, during my years as speaker, uh, Mr. Dingle and I uh, were, could not be better friends. Matter of fact, I had this ability to, to uh, hand out small, uh, small offices, hideaways, uh, that uh, the Senate has a lot of them, but the House only has a few. Uh, but uh, maybe I, we must have about 10 of them, but well, I, nine of them I gave, them gave them away to some of my friends and other leaders. Uh, but I had this one left. And I thought, you know, Mr. Dingle's not getting around real well. Uh, I'm going to give it to Dingle. And uh, he was shocked that uh, this Republican speaker would give uh, one of these hideaways uh, to, uh, to a Democrat. Uh, but he had it for a few years. And then uh, uh, the Democrat leader came to me and said, uh, hey, you know, uh, this, uh, uh, this room that uh, Dingle has isn't that mine to give out? I said, no, it's mine. And I gave it to the person I wanted to give it to. Uh, but, uh, you know, we accomplished, uh, frankly, an awful lot uh, during uh, the years that I was speaker. Uh, even though, uh, you know, Barack Obama was, uh, uh, was the president, uh, we had uh, uh, Harry Reid as, uh, as the minority leader or the majority leader in the Senate, uh, an awful lot got accomplished. Not because we agreed with each other every day, uh, but, uh, but we both, we all had commitments to do things and get things done that would benefit the American people. And while, you know, while President Obama and I didn't always agree, uh, the fact is we were always looking for common ground. People want to call it compromise, but it really isn't an accurate description of, uh, of, of what it takes to get things done. You know, uh, when I retired, the first phone call I got, or I announced that I was going to retire, first phone call I got was from George W. Bush. Beaner, get your rear end down here to Texas. I'm going to whip you on the golf course. Now, that's the cleaned up version of what he said. <laughs> I won't tell you what I said. Uh, but the uh, second phone call I got was uh, from President Obama. Hey, Boehner, you can't do this. We got to get this done. We got to get this done. We got to do this. We got to do some. We got to get a budget deal. We got to do something. The debt ceiling. And he was going on and on and on. And finally, uh, President Obama says, Boehner, man, I I'm going to miss you. I said, Mr. President, yes, you are. You know, uh, <laughs> the political process uh, requires a trait uh, that's going to be talked about here uh, at this conference, uh, and that is trust. You know, when I was a young member of uh, Congress, I used to watch uh, the leaders. And because uh, when you step back and think about the Congress, it's nothing more than a committee of 535 people. Anybody ever seen a committee of 535 people get anything done? No. Uh, but uh, it, it became apparent to me uh, that the leaders have to be able to trust each other, work together uh, on behalf of their members, but also on behalf of the country. And, uh, and if the leaders uh, didn't trust each other, nothing would get done. And while I didn't have uh, a lot to, I agree with, uh, with President Obama, or for that matter, Harry Reid or Nancy Pelosi, uh, the fact is, is that over the years, I probably couldn't have three better friends. Uh, we worked together, we trusted each other, and, uh, and as a result, uh, we were able to find common ground. I knew what he couldn't do, and he knew what I couldn't do. Uh, the question was, where, where's the common ground that would help move the country in the right direction? Now, you may have noticed uh, over the last couple of years that the political environment is a little different than it used to be. <laughs> I gotta keep reminding myself there's press in the room. You know, all I ever wanted to do was be myself, but sometimes my staff thought I was too much like myself. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, people ask, well, what, what happened? I just got back from uh, 10 days in Australia. Uh, people in Australia, uh, people in uh, Europe, uh, they all think we've lost our minds uh, because uh, they watch this political process uh, here in America and wonder what in the world's going on. Uh, but the question is, how did we get here? And I'll just, uh, I've got my own version of how we got here, but if you go back, uh, go back to 1994, and it just happened to be the first year, uh, or the year that Republicans won the, the House majority, the first time in 40 years. And if you go back to 1994, there was one radio talk show host in America, but almost nobody had ever heard of him. 
1994, there was one cable news channel that just did news. 1994, there was an internet, but only a couple of geeks in Palo Alto were using it. Uh, move 24 years ahead, what do we got? Thousands of talk radio people, uh, one trying to outright the other, uh, saying all kinds of things that may or may not uh, be true. Uh, you've got uh, uh, all these cable news channels, and all they do is politics 24-7. And, uh, and, and they've got people on there, so-called political experts, who I've never heard of. You know, it might be 22 years old. Oh, I'm sorry, 24. Uh, but, you know, they're experts. And, uh, but they're spewing out all this noise. And then, my God, you've got the Internet. So you can start any new association, group overnight. You've got Twitter. You've got Facebook. YouTube, get down the whole long list. The result is this. The American people are being inundated uh, with information about their government and politics like they had never seen before. And, uh, you know, whether they're getting 100 times more, 500 times more, I don't know. But all this information that's out there now is tending to push or pull people into one or two camps, leaving fewer and fewer people in the middle. Uh, the second problem is that the speed at which they get this information is instantaneous. It used to be, you know, I came down to, uh, and see the president, uh, cut some kind of a deal, and at least there were, I had a few hours, maybe overnight, to get something done uh, before, you know, the press got a hold of it. Well, it got to the point where I used to have to sneak into the White House. Uh, because if I walked into the White House, the right-wing press would go crazy. Oh, my God, Boehner's at the White House. The uh, president's going to roll him once again. And the left-wing press would go crazy. Oh, my God. Boehner's at the White House visiting Obama. Uh, he's going to take him for a ride one more time. And uh, all of a sudden, <laughs> you've got no room to maneuver. And it makes governing uh, in this modern era almost impossible. But there's a third component that, uh, that really makes it all much worse. You get all this news. It all comes instantaneously. And, but because there's so much news, people get to choose where they get their news. You know, for a lot of us in this audience, there wasn't any choice. You, you could go to ABC, NBC, or CBS, because that's where the news came from. You know, you had five big radio stations in America, five big newspapers. They decided what the news was. Uh, but today, there's so much news, you get to choose. So where do people go? They go to places they agree with, reinforcing the divide that we have in this country. Uh, people want to know how Donald Trump got elected? Just look at this. Uh, it's there. It's probably going to be there for some time uh, because uh, a lot of Americans, you know, think they're either Democrat or Republican. They're liberal or conservative, but they've forgotten one thing. First, we're Americans. And we are the luckiest people in the world because... Uh, <laughs> You know, in America, you can grow up and be anything you want to be. Uh, there's no country in the world that has the kind of mobility, upward mobility, that we have in the United States. And yeah, it's gotten a little duller than it was, uh, than it used to be over the last 10 years. Uh, but it's still a country where there's no limit on what you can accomplish. There's no class system. And it's the only country in the world where you can grow up as the son of a bartender and end up as the Speaker of the House. Thanks for being here. Joining John Boehner on stage is the anchor of WDIV TV4, Devin Skillian. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Speaker told me last night he thought this would be a lot more fun with Bloody Marys. And, and I really think you'd do this. Why not? Well, the other problem is the marijuana dispensary doesn't open for a few hours. <laughs> I'm reminding myself that the press is here, so <laughs> I can't really be. Well, in fact, let's let's start there. <laughs> after um, after long, well, you're not going to drink yours. Oh, I've got it right. No, oh. I'm, I'm happy to join you. No, oh, I, right. I'm sorry, I apologize. It's <laughs> a good one. I think I'm going to need this. That's a good one. Um, 
years ago, you said you were uh, unalterably opposed to legalized marijuana, I believe was the phrase that you used. And now you are on the board of directors of an outfit called Acreage Holdings, which is basically the weed business. I'm curious about your transformation on that. You know, uh, <laughs> I found myself over the last 10 years uh, looking uh, at a lot of issues differently than I used to. And, uh, and one of the things, uh, especially over the last four or five years, is the number of people uh, that I know uh, that were using cannabis uh, in some form uh, to relieve uh, some medical issues. And uh, so I got into looking at uh, uh, the, the medical uses of, uh, of cannabis. And uh, it really is pretty remarkable. And, and the plant's been around for 4,000 years. Uh, societies have used it widely over those 4,000 years. Only in the United States over the last 100 years uh, have, have we decided this is really bad stuff. And then secondly, for those who want to use it recreationally, uh, which I've never used the product, don't intend to use the product, uh, but I don't really care if somebody wants to smoke a joint. Well, fine, let them go do it. Uh, but anyway, I find myself moving like a lot of other people did in the country. And today, uh, 29 states have voted to legalize yep. the use of cannabis in some form. Uh, nine of them, you know, wide open. Right. Uh, and, but you can see where this is going. Uh, over the next five or ten years, this will be available all over the country. But my focus is still mostly on the, almost entirely on the medical uses. Because it's a Schedule One narcotic, uh, almost no university will get anywhere close to it. Yeah. And so uh, there needs to be some real research, not, not anecdotal evidence, but real research on on whether this helps people or not. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence that it does, but it's time to do real research. Yeah, with uh, it's, it's appearing like it's gonna be on our ballot unless the Republicans circumvent it and maybe uh, get it passed uh, early in the, ha in the, in the legislature. Um, I'm, as you put that though about that you've changed your thinking on that and other things, what are the other things that you think that maybe you were wrong about that you came to well, I don't, have a transformation? Well, I don't know what I would say wrong Oh, about. I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> Mistaken, perhaps mistaken temporarily. No, no, people, people can change their views. And, uh, you know, take the whole gay rights issue. I mean, I, like millions of other, tens of millions of other Americans, mm -hmm. uh, have done this transformational shift in terms of how we view these things. Yeah. Well, I, I figure you'd, you have a hard time doing this and saying things like this when you're in elected office. Uh, but uh, I found myself looking at that situation entirely differently than I did uh, 10 years ago. No, frankly, not much different in terms of the thought process, the movement, uh, in terms of how I look at cannabis. It's interesting, we tend to uh, deride people for changing their mind. We see it as, as, we, as waffling or not being consistent, and we seem to reward stridency a lot of times, which doesn't allow for a lot of evolution. Correct. Yeah, interesting. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit more about uh, the collegiality problem that we have right now in Washington. You and I uh, spoke last night for a while, and you said that you probably don't have a better friend in the world than Harry Reid, which is interesting um, because I imagine there's very little uh, of the big political issues that you guys uh, find common ground on, but that's the collegiality that seems to be very missing right now. Yes, it does. and uh, and. You know, people want to blame the Congress or blame the people in the Congress, uh, but let me share something with you. Members of Congress reflect the views of their constituents, and their constituents are like this. And while, and while those relationships are still there, uh, my goodness, uh, if I were still there and, and I wanted to go uh, do something publicly with Harry Reid and cut some deal, attempt to, the right wing would go crazy. And the left wing would go crazy on Harry because they don't want you to work with the other side. And so I, I, I don't blame the members entirely. You know, I used to get a lot of heat uh, because I worked with Obama or worked with Harry Reid, but mm -hmm. you know, I didn't go to Congress because I wanted to be a congressman. I sure as hell didn't go there to be speaker. I went there to do something on behalf of my country. And uh, that means you have to work with people. Our political process was designed to be difficult. Uh, our, our Constitution uh, minimizes great swings uh, in, in the movement of our government by design. Mm -hmm. 
And so uh, to get things accomplished in Washington, you've got to just stay at it, stay at it, stay at it. And, uh, and you've got to have people that'll work with you. Yeah. You know, when uh, Harry Reid and I were, would cut a deal, uh, I'd hold up my end of the deal, and he would hold up his end. And out of that, uh, we got, we developed a real relationship with each other. And, uh, and it exists to this day. Yeah. Um, I think most people that I know who have been in Congress or are in Congress speak the same way about why they got there. And yet, um, something happens. Uh, you mentioned the, this uh, unwieldy committee. John Adams once said that uh, one worthless man is a disgrace, two worthless men become a law firm, and three or more become a Congress. <laughs> but <coughs> it must be Screw very... Him. <laughs> <clears throat> it must be <laughs> it must be terribly painful and galling when you're in it to find that uh, you are held in such low esteem as a body by the American people. The American people have used the Congress as their favorite whipping boy for 240 years. Yeah. It's just a fact. Uh, but remember, the Congress is never on the ballot. You know, I have to read, people talk about how low the ratings of Congress are. We got 535 people. We got some of the smartest people in America that serve in the Congress, and some of the dumbest. <laughs> we got some of the nicest people you'd ever meet. Hold on, who would say that? Some of the be? raunchiest, all right? <laughs> but I'll say this 95% of the people I served with in the Congress on both sides of the aisle are the most decent, honest people you've ever met all trying to do the right things for their constituents yeah. and for the country. Yeah. Now there are 5%, you know, they're made up of two and a half on each side of the aisle, who, they just ought to go away. Uh, but you know, if they weren't there, there'd be people just like them there, so. 95% is pretty good. Yeah. Um, the stridency that, that you're describing, though, um, that is developed in America, um, I, I, is, is, part of, is one part of my next question, but I want to talk to you about what's happened with the Republican Party. Um, there is no Republican Party. There's a Trump Party. The Republican Party is kind of taking a nap somewhere. Well, that's, um, there was a time when if we talked about slapping tariffs on goods, Rush Limbaugh would have had a heart attack. Now, all of a sudden, it seems acceptable or it's, it's part of the, uh, of the way forward. And I'm, I'm curious as to how you think that that has, has occurred. He's not the only one, it's just the most prominent example. Well, you know, uh, Donald Trump, who I know well, was one of my supporters. And when I was speaker, I was having a rough week. Trump would call me, pat me on the back, cheer me up. Uh, we played a lot of golf together. Uh, but president, really? Uh, <laughs> I, I never quite saw this. Uh, but, uh, you know, <laughs> the guy ran, the guy won. Uh -huh. Now, remember what I said earlier, right? Elections are one loss, not based on what the polls say. They're one loss based on who shows up to vote. And, uh, you know, Trump's people showed up, and Hillary's didn't. The two most surprised people in the entire world that night were Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. <laughs> Hillary Clinton thought she was going to win. Donald Trump thought he was going to lose. And, uh, and I think Donald Trump promised Melania that he would not win. Yeah. She didn't have to worry about ever living in the White House. Probably why she doesn't look real happy every day. Yeah. But, <laughs> well, maybe one reason. <laughs> uh, but uh, listen, Trump style. Kind of stormy outside right now, too. That was really low hanging fruit. I apologize. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. I digress. I know, but yes, you haven't I'll, touched I'll, your drink. I'll go uh, back to that. Thank you. I really don't like drinking alone, <laughs> especially at 9.30 in the morning. I won't let you do that. <laughs> Listen, Donald Trump's style is not quite my style. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, it's, it's clearly the most unusual person we've elected as president. Mm -hmm. uh, but... Uh, if you can peel away the noise and, and the tweets and all that, which is virtually impossible to do, but if you peel all this away from a Republican standpoint, the things that, he, or things that he's doing, by and large, uh, are really good things. Well, the deregulatory stuff, the, the regulatory overreach that we saw uh, during uh, the Obama years, you know, being 
uh, peeled back and slowed down. Uh, I think from a foreign policy standpoint, forget the trade for a moment, but from a foreign policy standpoint, our allies, by and large, are thrilled to death uh, that America's leading. They want, the world wants America to lead. That's uh, not how it always feels. Well, I know it. I, trust me, I understand that. But We seem very having, at odds with our closest allies right now. Well, no, no. That's, oh, we'll get to trade in a moment. Okay. Uh, but in terms of leadership, when America's not leading, uh, no one else is capable of doing this. And so uh, they're, they're thrilled that Trump is leading. They want to be part of our team. And uh, so whether it's the Middle East, whether it's Asia, fine. Now, the Europeans are the Europeans. They don't really matter. Uh, <coughs> Ouch. If you, think the, if you think the press in the, in the U.S. is bad, go to Europe. <laughs> they're really awful. <laughs> really awful. No, well, my point is, uh, he's doing the right things on foreign policy. You know what? Look at uh, North Korea. Oh, I've watched presidents for 30 years deal with this for 30 days, 60 days, and they move on. Something happens, they move on. Trump has been on North Korea like white on rice uh, for 15 months. Mm -hmm. He's like a dog with a bone in his mouth. And, uh, and this is a real problem that has to be dealt with. It's gotten to be a bigger problem over these last 30 years. And uh, we'll see whether there's some movement. I've got my doubts about how much we're going to get out of Un. Uh, but, uh, but when it comes to these trade practices, uh, you have to understand something. I don't think Trump is trying to start a trade war. I think well, he what, said they're easy to win. Well, I don't, I don't think there's going to be a trade war. I think what Trump is doing, not the way I would do it, is that he's driving people to the negotiation table. Trump wants to cut a deal. And, uh, and so if you looked at some of the early efforts, Australia pretty well resolved our differences there. Uh, South Korea, I think we resolved our differences there. Uh, you still have uh, China, you've got uh, uh, the Europeans. And, uh, but you know, how far can he push China on a trade deal when we need China and South Korea if we're going to solve the problem in North Korea? And so uh, the Chinese... You have wanted, I, my hunch is John Boehner, as speaker, would have urged the U.S. to be a signatory and a partner in the TPP. Uh, yes, uh, I was a big supporter of TPP yeah. until we got to the end. There were five big issues on the table, and I told President Obama, I said, listen, these five issues are going to make or break this trade deal. And, uh, and I pointed out where I thought the votes had to be uh, and where the policy had to be if we were going to ever be able to pass it. Well, it went south at the end, and, uh, and so TPP died uh, well before the election. It was, there weren't five votes in the whole Congress for it. Uh, but uh, bringing that back from the dead is going to be hard. But I think what Trump is trying to do is get people to the table and negotiate. Uh, there are some long-standing imbalances that really need to be addressed. Uh, again, I would do it a little differently than he is. But uh, yeah. uh, one of the other current things, and you're talking about regulatory rollbacks. Um, go ahead. Yes, well, you can, we can sip if you'd like together. I don't want to <laughs> leave you hanging. That's all right. There you go. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to drink it whether you drink it or uh, Oh, okay. All right. Good. Uh, um, we're watching right now a rollback of a lot of regulations on banks. Uh, we're watching um, some uh, Dodd-Frank uh, changes. Uh, there are a lot of Americans, especially that group that supported Bernie Sanders, and the, he won this state in the primary, um, still very upset that nobody was held responsible ultimately for the collapse of the world financial industry. Um, and that uh, we are slowly giving that rope back out again that we, that we brought in, which will eventually leave us just as imperiled as it did once before. Well, I don't think that's the case. Dodd-Frank uh, had the perverse effect of taking care of the 12 largest financial institutions uh, and punishing everybody else in the financial services industry. Bizarre. Those people had nothing to do with, with the financial collapse. And so when you look at what's happened, there was a big bipartisan bill just passed last week out yep. of the House and the Senate, yep. bringing some normalcy uh, to the rules for community banks and smaller banks and smaller financial institutions around the country. Uh, and on the regulatory side, there's been some rollback uh, because uh, what happened after Dodd-Frank is that the big banks got bigger 
the big banks uh, uh, didn't have as much uh, regulation, but everybody else did. And so uh, I would argue that what's happening here is a, what, a more of a leveling of the playing field mm. uh, in terms of uh, giving the, the smaller players, regional players, a better chance at competing. The crisscross of the Trump supporters and the Bernie Sanders supporters, though, I think was this feeling like the fix is in for uh, the big guys always taken care of. And if anybody who's watched the film The Big Short um, comes out of that seething saying, how was nobody held responsible for what happened? Well, there are some people who went to jail. A lot of people lost their jobs. Uh, and one or uh, two people who went to jail. Well, yeah. But uh, the fact is, is that there's some people that broke the law, but others were playing a game. And they got caught playing the game yeah. and lost a lot of money. Yeah. But people think the political spectrum is linear. Sorry. Straw's, <laughs> yeah, straw's getting in my way here. <laughs> Uh, the political uh, spectrum is not linear, it's round. And uh, what's really interesting is that the far right and the far left are right up here together. Yeah. Because uh, they're both pretty kinky and goofy. Uh, uh, I've worked with them. <laughs> but, but it kind of tells you what happened in the presidential primary last time. And frankly, the time before that. Presidential primaries bring out the right of the right and the left of the left. Mm -hmm. Normal Democrats and normal Republicans, by and large, don't show up and vote in the primaries. And as a result, uh, we, get these, uh, we get these candidates uh, from, uh, from well, not always from the fringes, but near the fringes. And, uh, and so it sets up a you know, pretty interesting presidential race like we had in 2016. Yeah, yeah. I want to talk and a way to solve this is for average Democrats and average Republicans to show up in a primary uh, and elect people more like themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to talk to you about health care. Um, I don't know too many people who are really completely thrilled with their health care, and yet everybody's Talking very... about health insurance or health care? Uh, actually, I guess I would say both. There's, um, we, we, there's two different issues. We talk about it as one. But there's two different issues. We got the best health care system in the world. Uh, and bar by what metric? Would bar you, would bar you none. In terms of the numbers of health professionals, the number of facilities, the quality of the care, uh, bar none, we've got the best health care delivery system in the world. Now, the problem is nobody wants to pay for it. All right? <laughs> the government doesn't want to pay for it. Individuals don't want to pay for it. Somebody's got to pay for it. And so we have this health insurance system uh, that's a mess. So what do we do about that? And, and we seem to have a fatalism around not being able to build a better system than the one that we have. Well, I mean, I don't know why, we, why there really isn't a push to just build a better mousetrap. Well, for instance, why is my... People have been why trying my, to do this for 100 years. Y yes. And I haven't succeeded yet because nobody wants to pay for it. Now, the foundation of our health insurance uh, business are, is employer-provided health insurance. You know, it started back in, uh, frankly, in the early 1940s when there were wage and price controls. Mm -hmm. Companies were, were trying to hire people, and so they started to offer health insurance because that, that wasn't capped. And uh, it began something that today, 125 million Americans uh, get their health insurance through their employer. Does that make any sense in 2018? Probably not, but it is the foundation of our insurance system. Uh, for those who, who don't get it there, uh, today you probably have almost as many on Medicaid, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, has grown by leaps and bounds. Mm -hmm. And so the, and the government takes care of them up to 133% of poverty. So who are the people who, who don't have access or don't have good access? And uh, I would call it the middle class and the working poor who make too much to be on, on Medicaid uh, and, uh, and their health insurance is expensive. And so uh, the whole idea behind the Affordable Care Act was to try, I thought, was to try to take care of that problem. Yeah. But the Affordable Care Act was really more of a government takeover of the entire health care delivery system, rules, regulations, instead of focusing in on you know, what the real issue was. And so uh, I, I got in trouble about uh, a year ago because I said I don't think they're going to repeal and replace Obamacare. Uh, I think they're going to repair it. 
uh, which uh, they really haven't done yet. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's, there are repairs that will make this work, uh, that will empower states, empower individuals, uh, and lessen the role of government in this. Uh, but uh, Which would suggest you'd like the guts of Obamacare to stay in place. Uh, I would give more control over to the states. Mm -hmm. uh, I would empower more individuals, empower individuals, take more choices. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the states would do a much better job of uh, running these exchanges, making products available uh, for their citizens uh, than some bureaucrat at uh, the Department of Health and Human Services in Washington, D.C. There's some thought among uh, conservatives that it, it, it will actually be conservative thought that will finally get us to universal health care simply because it universal will be Universal health insurance? We have universal health care. Well, yeah, universal health insurance, if you want. Okay. Um, because it will finally become apparent that it's the only financially efficient way. Uh, that it will be the most conservative way because it'll be the, it'll be the, the, the most cost-effective way to deliver health care. Well, that's not exactly conservative thought. Uh, uh, not yet, but that's, uh, that, that's, I've read a, a few pieces by conservative thinkers who think that that's, we just need to hit fast forward because eventually that's where we'll be. Listen, I, I, I believe in the American people. They're smart. They'll figure it out. And the more the, the government gets out of the way and empowers people, uh, frankly, from my standpoint, the better off we're going to be, when I, whether it's health insurance or a whole slew of other things. Hmm. Um, I'd like to get now to, back to when you were talking about trust, and I'd like to get to what I guess I call the reporter's lament right now. Um, I am, as, as a journalist, I am not in the opinion business. A lot of the people who are more prominent, <clears throat> the... Well, that's because you are a journalist. <laughs> well, All right. <clears throat> I... <clears throat> Well, I try to be. Um, but you go back to, to what I was saying earlier. When you look at uh, what's happened with the internet and, and Facebook and Twitter uh, and YouTube and get out the whole list, everybody today is a journalist. Everybody's spewing out news. Mm -hmm. uh, most of it has an awful lot of opinion wrapped around it. Yeah. And it is hard to find real news. It's hard to find what is the truth. Now, I read enough uh, publications, left and right, because they're all left or right, you know, hardly any down the middle. Uh, and uh, you know, out of all that, you can kind of sort out what's real and what isn't. But it's hard to figure out what's real. Well, and, and that's partly been the journalism's world own, own doing, because in the old days, you had to turn six pages into the paper to find the editorial section. Now, when you go to a website, it's all jarbled together. Who knows what's there? But the, of the journalism cake, the icing that gets all the attention are people like, I don't know, uh, Maureen Dowd, the, the columnists, uh, Nolan Fenley, uh, for our, our local purposes, uh, Rochelle Riley, columnists. The bulk of the cake is made up of people like me who are really not in the opinion world, we're just reporters. Right. From my very first day in journalism school, I was taught that the only thing that was going to carry me through my entire career was to obsess about the truth, to obsess about accuracy, which I've done, I guess, for 34 years. Now, here comes a president who is so loose with the truth and lies with such felicity that it, it is a little bit like taking all of those reporters in the room and every day poking them in the, in the eye with a stick because it's where our... OCD is colliding with his Tourette's syndrome, in a way. <laughs> so, well, you know, I'm trying growing, to up, growing up in politics, uh, you learn a couple lessons early. First lesson you learn is never get into a pissing match with a skunk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, the president, now the president does it every day, all right? Right. The second thing you learn is never get in a fight with people who buy ink by the by barrel. barrel. Right. Uh, he does it every day. So it's different. Yes, I agree. So when I. <laughs> so the choice for many of us who um, are, are reporters every day is do we obsess, continue to obsess over some of these lies, which really don't matter much. But his very first day on the job, the White House told us that it was the biggest crowd to ever witness an inauguration. From the very first day. Now, is that important? I, I wouldn't say that it really is. 
And yet, do I just let it go? And this has now happened, at least according to the Washington Post fact checker, over, these are, we're up to over 3,000 untruths, half-truths, or outright lies. And the, point the, is, and the point is? The point is, where He's president, are, and you're not. That's, well, that's exactly right. right. <laughs> but, but when you're talking about the breakdown of trust, if we no longer are going to expect the truth, or anything um, even remotely resembling the truth, where are we going 20 years hence when he's no longer president? Well, listen, uh, my whole career was pretty straightforward. I wanted to be me. I didn't want to be somebody else that I wasn't. I was going to tell people the truth, uh, even when it was difficult. Uh, because uh, at the end of the day, uh, the truth is always going to show up. It might as well just show up right up front. And, uh, and uh, I think the thing that surprised me the most when I retired, uh, or announced my retirement, is I was there for another five weeks in Congress as a speaker. And uh, the number of members who came up to me, Democrat and Republican, who said, thanks for always being honest with me. Uh, because, uh, you know, they can come in and ask for all kinds of things, need all kinds of things, and if I could help them out, I would. But if I couldn't, I couldn't, and I'd tell them. Uh, but uh, being up front and honest with people uh, paid big dividends for me. Now, you know, as I said, the president's got a different style. And, uh, and, uh, but he is the president. And so uh, we'll live through this. Listen, when Barack Obama got elected in 2008, every Republican I knew thought the world was coming to an end. Well, we lived through that, all right, fine. Now, we get to 2016, Donald Trump gets elected. Now, every Democrat thinks the world's coming to an end, and half the Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> You're the one who said but, there is no Republican but, Party right now. <laughs> but <laughs> we're going to live through this, too. The media, uh, social media, the big media, all spend way too much time focusing uh, on, on the, the White House, uh, as if it's uh, White House directs everything happening in the country. Our society is bigger than the White House. Our society is stronger uh, than wh whoever is occupying the White House. Our economy is the most resilient economy in the world because Americans are the most resilient people uh, in the world. And, and so I, I don't get, I, I, don't, I don't watch much news, I have to tell you. Mm. I mean, I don't, you, when you turn the TV on, it's either going to be left or right, all right? You can't really, I don't want to listen to any of it. I just want to th throw up in the morning. Jeez. <laughs> Jeez. There are days when I just want to do this, all right? <laughs> I don't, I, I don't. That's why I took care of you. I don't, but no. uh, uh, we just obsess too much about it, yeah. like you are right now. Yes. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. Get over it. <laughs> That's tough, because that's what I mean, to just continually uh, tell me a, a, a half-truth or an untruth is like standing in front of a bunch of cardiologists and going through a pack of cigarettes. I, I, you're just poking them in the eye, and I shouldn't I went, smoking. I, I just went, spent the last three days with my two daughters, a son-in-law, and uh, my two grandchildren. And uh, my oldest daughter, Lindsay, God bless her, uh, is obsessed. Uh, with her dislike of uh, the president. And she wants to engage me in a conversation, just like you're trying. <laughs> Bait me into a conversation all day long. And it went on for four days, and I just kept, go away. Just go away. <laughs> you want to talk about something I don't want to talk about. Okay. <laughs> go away. <laughs> Sorry. Let me... Uh... I'm going to stay with you for another eight minutes and 40 seconds. Oh, oh it, can't go, it can't go away quick <laughs> enough. You know, one thing I forgot, you know, there were, I had a lot of great uh, successes during my time in, uh, in uh, Congress and my time as Speaker, but the one thing I, I failed to mention is that uh, uh, one of the greatest uh, things that happened to me was, uh, was having Pope Francis come and address a joint session of Congress uh, in September of 2015. Yeah. I had tried for 20 years to get a pope to come to the U.S. Started in 1995, tried to get John Paul to come and, and didn't, wrote him a letter, didn't hear anything. And, and uh, we get to uh, uh, 
uh, four or five years later, uh, Pope Benedict gets elevated. I sent him a letter, hear nothing. Although he did come to the White House, he didn't come to the Hill. Uh, but you know, we have these joint sessions where the House and the Senate come together, the administration, and uh, like a State of the Union. But I really wanted the Pope to do this. And so uh, when Francis got elevated, I'd send him a letter. And I uh, didn't hear anything for about six months. And Cardinal World, the Archbishop of Washington, a friend of mine, was uh, on his way to the Vatican to try to convince the Pope to come in 2015. It was like February 2015. And uh, Pope uh, told Cardinal World, no, not coming to the U.S. in 2015. I'm going here, I'm going here, I'm going here. Uh, well, maybe some other year. He said, but I got this letter from your parliament. I'm somewhat intrigued by it. Well, Cardinal Will says, in the United States, it's our Congress, and a guy who wrote this letter is a guy named John Boehner, and, you know, he does all these things for thousands of kids in D.C., and I'm sure he laid it on thick. And so uh, the Pope says, okay, I'll come. So Will runs out of, the, out, of the, out of the office, calls me, and says, now, you can't tell anybody, but he's coming, he's coming. <laughs> well, it turns out my daughter's pregnant with my first grandchild. And so Cardinal Will well, a couple weeks later, we get a date. He's coming on September 24th. My grandson's going to be born six weeks before this. And so uh, Cardinal World, Cardinal Dolan, New York, uh, start working the Vatican over to get the president, or the Pope, to baptize my little buddy, my grandson. Well, you have to remember the Vatican has a 2,000-year head start on bureaucracy over us. <laughs> <laughs> they are really, really good at this. <laughs> So finally, uh, as it goes back and forth for months, uh, the Vatican says, listen, we'd be happy to have the Pope bless your grandson, but we don't really want him to go Baptist. Fine, wonderful. So uh, we get to September 24th, 2015. I got every camera in the world in my office. They're all there. And uh, here I am, Catholic grade school, Catholic high school, Catholic university. I was an older boy, and here comes the Pope. And you know, I can get a little teary-eyed once in a while. Well, I was a mess, so <laughs> I'm, I'm standing there, you know, they're all, all the cameras are behind me, I'm, I'm sucking it up, I'm really trying to hold it together, but I, I finally got it together, Pope came, they all got their pictures, got rid of them. We go to sit down in my office, and there are seven cardinals and a Pope. I looked at my chief of staff, who happens to be Catholic, I said, what the hell are we doing here? <laughs> so we had a nice meeting with a Pope, uh, and the meeting, about 30 minutes, it starts to break up, and... Uh, my family's in this adjoining room, so they start to come in. And the Pope and I get up, and the Pope uh, is looking around, and he finds his assistant and says, get me a glass of water. No. <laughs> really? Oh, my God. So I'm watching the assistant go, gets, gets his glass, gets a glass of water, and brings it back to the Pope, and the Pope takes it from him in his right hand, and he puts it in his left hand, and I'm waiting for him to bless it. He just took a drink. <laughs> the greatest head fake you have ever seen in your life. <laughs> but I have to tell you, I had an amazing morning with the Pope. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and so we're getting ready to leave, and Pope's getting ready to leave, and there's this big departure ceremony. And, and so uh, uh, we're on the first floor. They're kind of holding us back, and I look up. It's just the Pope and me. There's not another soul anywhere around. And the Pope takes his left arm and grabs my left arm and pulls me next to, to him and starts saying the sweetest things that anybody's ever said to me. Well, I'm like a fire hose. I mean, I'm a mess. <laughs> He's still holding on to me. He gives me this bear hug with his right arm and he says, Speaker, please pray for me. Yeah. Who? Me? <laughs> I will, I will. But I do. But... Uh, we had a reception afterwards, and uh, members, both sides of the aisle, both sides of the Capitol, were thrilled to death. And I was going to announce in November that I was leaving uh, at the end of 2015. Uh, but that afternoon, I thought to myself, you know, this, I've never seen members this happy in the 25 years that I've been here. Yeah. Uh, it's not going to get any better than today, so I'll do this tomorrow. <laughs> uh, but uh, it was a great experience, and uh, I love my time. Uh, you, you may have just answered then. My, my last question was going to be the proudest that you ever were while you were... Oh, yeah. Well, that was it. That was it. Oh, that was it. No question. Yeah. That's I think it's better for me than the Pope. <laughs> I do want to go to heaven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
That's extraordinary. I haven't, I haven't had to get my handkerchief out yet, either. <laughs> Some people really work at trying to get me to tear up, which really isn't very hard. Well, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't ask you about the Pope story. You, you did that oh, on no, your own. Oh, no, no, that's that because, was, that, because that, I was trying to get you off whatever. I understood. You were talking about. <laughs> very. I thought it'd be more entertaining oh, it, for the it audience. It wasn't lost on me. I, it was very slick. <laughs> I thought it'd be more there. entertaining for the audience to <laughs> talk about something <laughs> more interesting. No, <clears throat> kidding. Blair, you're about out of time now. No, you, I know. You got no, two no. minutes. No. It, 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 I'm not being able to finish my drink. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, if, if you had the biggest disappointment, though, of something that you weren't able to accomplish that yes. you wanted to do, what was that? In 2011, uh, we had to raise the debt ceiling. I was a brand new speaker. I worked for six months with President Obama to convince him that big things that happen and last happen when both parties' fingerprints are on the deal. Yeah. I made it very clear I was not going to raise the debt ceiling without doing something about our spending problem. For 60 of the last 65 years, we've spent more money than what we brought in. You can't do this in your home, you can't do it in your business, and your government can't do it either. And, uh, and so, uh, during the, the five years that I was speaker, it was clearly the issue I spent more time on was trying to stop, slow down, or stop our spending problem. And uh, so the president and I came to a, an agreement, late July 2011, a $5 trillion deficit reduction package uh, that, uh, that was the first 10 years, with long tails. It wouldn't have solved our spending problem but it would have put a giant dent in it. And the President and I, Eric Cantor, stood in the Oval Office on a Sunday morning and shook hands on the deal. The whole White House was involved. Three days later, he walked away from the deal. Uh, I can't even tell you the disappointment I went through. Uh, we ended up with a $2 trillion deficit reduction package uh, called Sequester. Awful way to cut spending, but it worked. Uh, but nothing even comes close to yeah. disappointment. Yeah. Um, you, you didn't drink much of your drink, I, you know? I've been talking. I, I, in fact, maybe I did more talking than listening. I'm sorry about that. Well, I, um, but it, that's what most uh, journalists do. Great reporters do. I do. <laughs> Walked right into that. <laughs> um, you, you, you told me last night, though, that uh, you don't miss it right now, being around it, being a part of it, being in the... Oh, look at the look on your face. Who would miss this? <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it's just... It's too divided. The country's too divided. And the left and right are just gnawing at each other. You got the press pouring gasoline on this fire every day. I, who wants to be part of that? I mean, I talk to my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. Yeah. I get to D.C. about once a month. I slide in and try to slide out. And, you know, but I get to see a few people, and you know, and people aren't very happy. That's why you see this record number of retirements. People just, it's not fun. But your faith clearly remains in the American people. You're traveling around the world a lot right now. You mentioned earlier about our, the way that our mobility works in society better than any other society in the world. Um, but as you travel around now, that, that bullishness on our future remains, right? Oh, yes. There's no question about it. Uh, we've got a strong economy. Uh, when I talked about resiliency, when I was saying the words, I was thinking about Michigan. I'm thinking about what Michigan went through. Uh, you know, whether it was uh, the late 70s and early 80s uh, with uh, the Japanese imports, what it went through uh, after the financial uh, impact. I mean, what Michigan's been through, most other states haven't. Uh, but it's, the, it's one of the clearest examples of the resiliency I was talking about. Because Michigan has come back in a huge way. Uh, <laughs> I think we can drink to that. Ladies and gentlemen, former Speaker of the House, John Boehner. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>